recording and transcription. Over to you. OK, sure. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third talk for the HCI Research Group here in the Computer Science Department at Brunel. I'd like to introduce uh, Nadine Wagner, who is from the University of Bremen. And um, Nadine is actually a third year PhD student researching, as you can see, um, defining the uh, basically um, interested in um, how VR can be used to improve mental health. Um, and Nadine is going to tell us all about um, her interests and her projects. Um, and I'm sure Nadine will add on everything that I have not introduced her um, with. Um, so take it away. Thank you very much for being here today, Nadine. <laughs> Thank you so much, Monica. Also, again, uh, huge thanks for the whole uh, or to the whole Brunel University group and uh, others that are interested in this talk and that uh, cared to invite me. I'm I'm really pleased to be here and to talk today about defining uh, defining the design space of mental well-being support virtual reality apps. I hope that uh, most of you will uh, or are familiar with virtual reality in the broad concept, which will help uh, in in this talk. If I'm too fast at some points, please do feel free to interrupt me. And if not, like uh, we have some time for questions uh, later on. Um, before I start to talk about the topic itself, let me quickly show if I can change the slides. It was working before. There we go. Um, just some uh, words about who I am and where do I actually come from. Um, I was born in the middle of, of Germany, quite uh, quite the middle, um, and I did my bachelor's in media sciences and English culture, so nothing really that is useful, I would say, for, for HCI. Um, but I read a lot of books uh, and I learned to read a lot and uh, to, to deal with literature as well. But it was a little bit too little technical uh, stuff for me. So uh, I decided to switch universities, move up north, um, and did my master's in interdisciplinary media sciences then. And together with uh, Volkswagen in Wolfsburg, I wrote my master's thesis. Um, you can see one of the pictures of me in a virtual uh, car, kind of. Uh, to the right. Um, yeah, and in this master thesis, it was actually the first time that I uh, got to know virtual reality and also got to love virtual reality because it's just a very unique possibility to be immersed in a completely 3D generated computer world um, where you have as a researcher the possibility to um, define all the parameters that you are not be able to define in, in reality. Um, and because I was so into like reading stuff on the one hand, but also doing studies, doing user studies in virtual reality, I decided to start my PhD in Bremen. So moving up further north, let's see where the future uh, will, will leave me up, probably in Norway or somewhere, I don't know. Um, yeah, but then I started my PhD in Bremen and I was very fortunate uh, that there was an open position um, with uh, Yvonne Rogers, who's an excellent chair there from the UCL in London. Um, so uh, she funded or still funds my, uh, my research, which is really nice because what I realized during my, um, during my academic pre-years, pre as I like to call them, is um, although technical stuff is great, the human component is really important for me. Um, I want to research how people interact with technology, but also how we can make technology better for them, you know, to put the, the human being in the center of my research. Um, and this is what also I've been, I've been doing here. So uh, I was very fortunate that I can study or uh, research now the topic that I'm really interested in, which is well-being support with virtual reality. Um, and we know from our daily life probably that it's sometimes super hard to really identify what we feel, for example. But it is actually good for well-being and for our mental health to be able to discern different emotions, to be able also to really relive them, but also then take a step back and look at them from, from a different perspective, maybe. So uh, the field of emotion regulation comes to mind. Also some psychotherapeutic um, applications that I think are super interesting um, as, a, as a general uh, motivation for my research. And uh, when I like started reading up on this whole topic in my first years, um, I found that there's like 
one major thing where I thought, well, why has no one really thought about this so far or not placed the importance on this aspect as I would like to do it in my research? And which is that every person is different. And there are so many applications out there, may it be on Steam or other application um, platforms, uh, may it be also in research that cater for one specific user group or offers one concept and you need to decide between all these different ones, um, the one that fits best. But why not put the user more into center? Why not uh, really cater for their thoughts because we cannot really look into them, you know, maybe they are in a, in a different on a different level. So why not really focus on what the user needs and give them the possibilities of technology to express themselves. Um, and so this was the general motivation of, of my PhD that I had. So I find myself in front of this huge mountain, uh, which is my PhD research. Um, and first of all, there's always important uh, to, to find the signpost, right? So I've discovered my general field of interest and the motivation, but where do I start from there? Um, so what I did then is um, to kind of look into two directions. First is to look into the role of the Our Wellbeing Support app. And I did this by doing expert interviews with psychotherapists about what they actually need apps to provide so that they can then support uh, mental wellbeing, but also what apps offer. And I looked into mobile apps and virtual reality apps to also kind of have like a comparison between both. And then I thought about, um, well, if I want to cater for the individual person and the individual needs, um, there might be a big population that actually uses the stuff that I develop at home. Um, and, and how do we need to make sure that um, it's a safe space for them at home that uh, they can actually yeah, um, provide for themselves? So for the first part, um, I was talking about uh, like doing the expert interviews um, and the, uh, the app reviews. We found some great themes. I will not go into detail here because we do not have the time, fortunately. Um, but there was a paper out of it. So if you're interested, um, feel free to find the paper online and uh, read up on it. Um, I will focus on the art here, of course. And um, the psychotherapist said it was really important that the art apps kind of offer the relive option uh, so that we that we relive a moment of time of memory, for example, but also to have offer some relaxation because it has the unique importance that the uh, reality is completely shut out and we should um, use this, of course. And it should also consider um, health as a holistic concept. So mental health is also um, related to social health, to uh, physical health. All these things actually kind of um, create a holistic picture. And for that, the art applications need to support them. They should offer teaching and tips. They should offer sharing possibilities with friends and also psychotherapists. And what uh, we did then is we uh, did some searches and we filtered out 15 VR apps that we looked at in detail, found on Steam and Oculus stores. Um, and here are some, just some examples. And uh, we found that a lot of them, like, like guided meditation, offer these predefined um, environments where you actually can just choose between them. Or when you look at Mind Labyrinth, we are dreams and E, you can literally define which environment you want to see, but you cannot interact with this environment. You cannot define this environment by yourself, um, which is something where we find like, oh yeah, this really differs and uh, is, is different from what the therapist actually told us, that you need to have the possibilities or the methods should be really caring for the individual person, which is also fitting to my general motivation, of course. Um, so, this is what we find there, and then in uh, some theoretical works here, we reflected on um, how we could reflect on emotions and how we should consider fundamental psychological needs um, in our research, and that these should be the principles that guide us to also motivate the people uh, to use the whole system at home. And um, as you can see here, one 
one thing is that they can actually create something by themselves. So we need to offer some tools for them that they can clearly understand um, when they need to, or if they want to create their own virtual environment, for example. We should also make sure that there are not just the six basic emotions that Eck told us about, but there are actually 27 emotions that uh, people or humans are able to discern. We should cater for all of them that they can be expressed. And last but not least, of course, being at home has some unique affordances. You have a very relaxing environment, for example, when you use VR in your living room. But on the other hand, you are also by yourself. Um, how do we make sure in our research and with our um, with our applications that we develop that people do not hurt themselves? And I'm not not just talking about the physical hurting yourself when you step into a wall, but also um, on a mental level. And um, from, from this first few steps, I have some takeaways that I would like to share here. Asking experts is mostly great because, of course, experts really try to give them your opinion about stuff and how you should develop stuff. But it's a very, very nice first step to really um, discern the, the topic. Then there is a mismatch between the demand uh, and offer of virtual reality apps that we need to or that we should address as HCI research groups. Um, there is a need for individualization and autonomy that we should um, also use in our designs. And the topic of emotions is a very delicate matter that we should be very careful um, to, to tackle in our research. And with that, uh, I started the journey up the mountain uh, to, you know, I have formed the basis of what is important. Um, and then, you know, you start with the first real project, as I call them, where you actually try to find things out. I will talk here in this regard about uh, three ones. The first one is to kind of define how the environment should look like so that it facilitates uh, well-being. In this case, there was a study about um, the role of the ground and footstep sound uh, when you use mindfulness apps. In VR. The second one is the role of autonomous design. So when you give people the option to create their own environments, what happens, what effects does it have on the person? And the third one is actually also to think about, um, about the negative effect, about negative emotions that you have, negative emotions, please in quotation marks, because there's no such thing. But we are talking about um, anger, about sadness, um, so very strong emotions uh, with um, when you when you look at the circumflex model um, have like a negative balance to them. How should we address those? And I will uh, start going a little bit more into detail with the first one. Um, it will be published this year at ICMI, so it's not yet published, but in November it will be. I'm very happy about that as well. Um, so what we did there is um, we had actual grass, artificial grass in the lab, um, and we had some uh, some uh, conditions where people could sit on the grass, where they could feel it, where they could stroke it, um, and others where they did the same mindfulness, mindfulness task without um, the artificial uh, feedback and the haptic feedback from the ground. And additionally, we also attached a sensor to the feet, as you can see on the right there, um, and when they moved around the grass, it would create the footsteps. We wanted to see how this correlates with, uh, with being present or feeling present in virtual reality and also with the level of mindfulness that could be reached for the uh, for the people. Um, here you can see a little bit how it looked like. So we had um, on the right, you can see the, the, the reality um, and we placed the, the virtual the artificial grass exactly on the doorstep in virtual reality so that when people moved between um, the hut outside and the, the lawn, uh, they could actually feel the difference there. Uh, later on, we also uh, used some more um, wooden planks, which you cannot see here in the video. And then, um, you know, they had the task to move around first and then later on to just sit and relax and have a mindfulness task there. Um, I will not go into detail here, but we had some quite fascinating um, results here. Um, so the tactile feedback from the grass actually enhanced presence and also mindfulness. 
because we thought maybe it would lead to people focusing on the grass, but instead it led that people focus on their own body, which is really important when you're doing mindfulness tasks. So um, that was actually a quite nice finding, and uh, which led us to think that if you have the possibility, use some haptic material. It can be also like maybe just a very tiny bit of grass in that case that helps people to focus on their own body um, by stroking and by offering tactile feedback. Um, yeah, this is also here where, where you can see that, especially for a uh, subscale body, uh, body that we have there, we found some significant um, effect uh, and influence of the tactile bond. And then the second project uh, is from this year's Kate. Um, it's called Gamivos because he used autonomous um, creation of a virtual environment to create a new world. Um, so pretty much an emotion-based world in which you can uh, relive the emotion that you were thinking of. And, and with this project we had in mind to contribute the design and implementation in a very exploratory way. Um, we wanted to, you know, try to find out if or what it does to people if they can um, choose objects, if they can choose different brushes and colors and environments to create their own safe space. Um, we did a small pre-study here due to uh, the time. I will probably also not go into detail here. Pretty much what we did is we used uh, paper and pen, actually, which is quite rare in HCI studies. But um, we wanted to find out if we give them all the tools that they are familiar with. You know, everyone has been drawing once or twice in their life during school or whenever. Um, we wanted to give them different, um, different photos, different objects, some uh, Play-Doh, everything that, you know, you could think of. We also allowed them to add personal items and we wanted to find out how do the pictures look like um, if they create sadness, which is for example here, uh, the left one, um, anger, which is in the middle, and one example picture of happiness is to the right. And then we uh, kind of discerned which, um, which objects and which colors were used the most. And with that, we uh, started then our evaluation and we created a prototype. Um, the study design that we had was in a remote setting, so we really wanted to cater for people at home. So um, the participants always had a VR headset and a VR equipment at home, and some of them could also choose to come to uni and borrow the one that we had. Here is uh, what it looked like in hand, if it wants to work. Yes, it does work. So you had the possibility to have different objects resized. Um, and place them in the virtual environment. Then we had different kinds of brushes that you could use to, uh, to draw around them, several environments, um, and animated objects like butterflies flying around here. You could choose lighting, you could choose different colors, so you could pretty much do whatever you wanted to do in this virtual environment um, to make it interesting. This is a demo video for the Kai this year as you can see. Um, and I also have another one, which just shows you a little bit of the animated uh, objects and some more um, types of brushes that you could use. It says that some of them were animated, some of them were not, just to give them as much freedom as could, else, as could actually be there. But we found out that um, positive emotion um, were significantly increased after they finished um, using VR mood boards, um, while the negative emotions pretty much stayed similar and also um, general happiness did not increase significantly. For us, for us it was even more important to um, research on a qualitative level, um, so there's, there's not enough time to go into detail here, but what we, can, what we did find was that people decided to choose uh, to represent emotions differently. Some of them uh, decided to really recreate their memory, as you can see here with gaming, winning with friends, where they even placed the books next to the TV. Um, and then some of them decided to rather um, 
base base the emotion in a setting. Um, for example, here it was the uh, even sun um, in a vacation. This is why it was the beach setting, although it was not really on the beach. And some of the people were really abstract and just choose um, forms and words and colors to represent emotions. They were really enjoying the um, autonomy and the empowerment that we offered through our tool. Um, and they said it was using this whole thing in VR was really important because they could stand in their work of art, they could feel it everywhere around them, they could move through them, um, which was important components for them. And then we, we checked if this actually does something for well-being. And yes, we can say the PERMA um, theory from Seligman, um, the PERMA pillars uh, were applied. Um, we were not so sure of eudaimonic uh, elements to see if it is also a positive technology. Um, there were like mixed, uh, mixed results there. In the end, they said uh, or they put some use cases. So participants reported they wanted to have interpersonal experience with some form of catalog where they can walk through their own mood world. Uh, some of them also said it would be cool to do together with friends or also psychotherapists if you want psychotherapy. And they said, well, we should also think about negative emotion worlds. Why not? And this also sparked. Um, sparked this uh, this next thing, which is an ongoing project, uh, which is used for how should we design for mitigating negative effect. So we want, of course, that to have a positive experience, but sometimes it can be really positive and also therapeutic to create a black or red anger world around them. But we should also make sure um, that, you know, people do not get into this rumination that they just stay stuck in their negative thoughts, because this is what we don't want. We want them to have to overcome this feeling, to reflect on them, to also accept this feeling as part of themselves. And um, yeah, pre-study with expert interviews is already done. Um, I will not go into detail here, um, but it will be a very nice, interesting project, how we can actually design for a negative effect. The takeaways that I have from here for you um, and for other researchers is, if possible, include some form of haptics if you want people to relax, to be mindful of uh, the body um, they have and of their own agency also. Um, and also for the general well-being, sometimes it's nice to have something tangible in your hands where you can actually um, hold on to. We also found often less is more. So when you design stuff, we had like this very elaborate, for example, mindfulness, this very elaborate um, virtual environment with like this, this beautiful mountain scene and animals and you had the noise of birds chirping and winds in the leaves. And we actually found, well, when you design for well-being, and in this case, mindfulness, um, sometimes it's also important to reduce the, um, yeah, the visual input, for example, from the outside. Also, the um, auditory feedback that we had was not really helpful, but rather disturbing the mindfulness process. Which led us to the question, why should we design at all? Why not have the participants design their own stuff if they are so like elaborate on what they want and some want this and some want that, which fits to our uh, prior research as well, which is then why we did mood worlds. Um, and I would say make well-being fun by design. So give them the opportunity to have something joyful because the Designing itself is therapeutic, which is also one finding from our prior study and also from Mood Wells, and um, should use the VR opportunities and the unique affordances that we do not have in 2D space and that we also do not have in reality. Um, and by making it fun, um, the possibility that it is also helpful for well being is uh, enhanced and facilitated. And last but not least, um, offer some autonomous design options, but also some scaffolding is needed because if not, people will drift into, oh yeah, what is this tool doing again? But we want them to have a positive effect out of it. So which is why we need some kind of framework, some kind of restrictions and guidance for them that actually help them through the process because we want them, we as researchers, we want them to take something out from it. 
with that, uh, I kind of reached the top of the mountain and I looked back on what I did and uh, I thought at that point, well, the user, user is now having super autonomous possibilities in my research, but as I said, especially regarding the last point, the scaffolding uh, is, is missing a little bit, is lacking a little bit. And I thought about how can we provide more data to the person and more or that actually helps them to reflect on their well-being and to actually enhance the well-being. So I thought, isn't there another way up this mountain? And in my research, I decided to go into uh, or to look further into physiological data, which we can use as a further input modality that helps and facilitates uh, well-being for the users. Um, for example, um, what would happen um, if we if we define the colors of the virtual environment based on the heart rate, which is, me uh, which is measure measured by a smartwatch. For example, um, when you have uh, an application for relaxation and you do relax and your heart rate lowers, the uh, environment would get nicer and, and more warm from the colors, more sunny also maybe. There is some related work doing exactly the opposite. So uh, they, change the virtual environment to evoke some emotions but so far in research that you as user with your health data can in, uh, can influence the environment has not been looked at so far which is also the inspiration for the second uh, project where we uh, looked at the role of um, of heart rate and color so um, we had their physical exertion game and we looked um, how, when the heart rate rises, how we can change the color from the environment to a dark red and what this then in turn uh, has, for, has for an influence for the participant. And then the next project is the role of weather for stress levels. So how is there maybe a different way of presenting data instead of saying, well, your heart rate is now 90 beats per minute. What does it mean for people? How can we create more meaning and also more uh, reflection on that? Um, I will, I think I have like five more minutes left. So I think I need to be short here. Um, so these were two, um, two workshop papers that we had and also some master thesis that were uh, dealing with, uh, with this topic. Um, as I said, about how we can adjust the virtual environment in an automatic way based on health data as input modality. I was talking about uh, weather changes. I was talking about color changes already. Um, and this is uh, another paper that we still try to publish um, where we looked at if the color of the environment that you see in virtual, in virtual reality actually has an influence on the actual exertion that you feel uh, that you have the perceived exertion when you are in a, in a physical game and also the emotional state that you are in in virtual environments and we found yes it does for some red is uh, becoming more dangerous but they also felt more motivated to be really really good it was based on beat saber if some of the, you know it um to really reach the end of the level um and this is also an ongoing project um, that i'm working on right now which is dealing with the topic of weather in VR um, and how we can use weather as a metaphor also to show stress levels and also emotional states um, and how this could be used uh, for reflection. We all know that uh, when we when we wear smartwatches and we had some physical activity or also our sleep pattern, our stress level during the day, when do we look at the data? Probably once a day in the evening if we are good for that. Um, and there's also research showing that people or a lot of people stop wearing smartwatches after six months because they're not interested anymore in uh, trying to figure out what's going on with their body. And uh, this could be a new playful way um, to interact with your data and to learn more about yourself, which is just as a concept uh, that you have like a way around you and you can actually choose to um, experience what you were feeling at that time. So for example, at 11 a.m. it was super sunny because you were not in stress, but at 1 p.m. you had this big fight with your with your boss. So it was like a, a thunderstorm. And you can actually choose to be immersed in this weather scenario in VR, which hopefully 
uh, enhances the reflection that you have and uh, gives you more insights into how you felt at that moment. As I said, ongoing projects, so this is why it's just an assumption, but I think it's, uh, it is a nice way to think of playful interactions um, that can make life more interesting and easier for people. So this is why when we have the metaphor of uh, hiking up the mountain again, there are also other ways to reach the same aim. And uh, in my opinion, there are even more mountains to climb in the future, uh, which I have not yet tackled, uh, but would really like to do so in the, in the future. For example, um, this is, this as, these are some design recommendations um, that I found in all my papers. I tried to put them all on one slide. Um, so what I can say as a summary is that when you want to define the design space of virtual reality apps for mental well-being, you should consider autonomy, you should consider mental well-being as a holistic concept that also encompasses physical health, social health and other entities. Um, and there are different approaches how to deal with this. You have or you should care for an autonomous, 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 sorry for that, design and some predefined framework or scaffolding that makes um, the life for users a lot easier. Uh, Multi-sensory experiences are favored, for example, using haptics, but we could also think about going into the direction of smell, for example, how does this help to not just immerse the person, but also for mindfulness tasks, for example. Uh, and it should be also uh, adaptable to personal use cases. For example, VR is something that you do at home. Why not use or why not do uh, an AR app that you can do in lunch breaks that does pretty similar things, but in a different setting. Um, in general, iterative procedures help to get people um, familiar with VR because it's still a new topic for, for a lot of people. Um, including haptics, it should be an aesthetically pleasing environment, it should be also rather simple, um, unobtrusive sound is favorite, and then there's of course this big question mark about future things to come. And with that, if you're interested to read up on this, because this was really just a very short presentation of what I've been doing so far, um, I have a list of publications here um, that I can hopefully, Monica, share around later. Um, and just that you know, because we were talking about the very diverse groups uh, of, of HCI researcher, uh, re HCI researchers that is uh, interested in this talk, our research group is also very uh, diverse. Um, so we have people uh, that are interested in haptic um, in VR, for example, to uh, have some adaptable possibilities to render weight by uh, changing the controller that you use. Um, close this here. We are, um, one of my colleagues is into well-being of children with augmented reality and also with tangibles, um, who did a study with children and their grandparents uh, where they use Lego bricks to build something together. Um, some of my colleagues are into navigation and spatial cognition e-health and medical technologies, user privacy is also a big thing, space exploration where an augmented reality app was created for a greenhouse um, on, on Mars and Moon. So also our group is a very diverse group, but I think it's actually a benefit because you, you profit a lot by the talks that you have with these colleagues that have actually a different background and different research area than you have. Um, and with that, I would thank you again uh, so much especially Monica, but also all the others that uh, found interested in listening to this topic. And I think we have some more time for some, some questions or uh, comments, if, if you have any. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, any questions, both online and here in the room? We have to come up to the microphone. Um, I, think, I think, I think, did you hear uh, Mark? Yes, I, I, okay, I did. Perfect. perfect, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> I, I've got a few related questions, and, and some of these come around to the huge effort that, I mean, by the way, I love the way that you presented uh, the, the graphics on here, but it kind of brought me into thinking about how hard it must be to build some of these worlds. And that kind of jumped me off into two separate related questions, which is, 
how much of this is the novelty effect of people seeing something very different and complex and, and weird that they hadn't experienced before? We know from HCI, novelty effects tend to impact on results very dramatically. The second side of that question is, is to do with the nature of the virtual reality that you're seeing here. Is it part of the VR that are causing these effects? Or do you think it might be something that we could extract from the VR and think about are these not necessarily virtual environments, but could we present them in some other form and get the same value from them? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Mark, um, or questions rather. Uh, regarding the first one, yes, the novelty aspect of virtual reality is the, a major flaw or limitation of research when you do it in virtual reality. Um, I always try to definitely have a tutorial round where they can just play around with the tool that uh, I've built um, as much as they want. Uh, sometimes this tutorial phase took like 20 or 25 minutes with some participants just because they really wanted to make sure that they knew all the features that were implemented there. And I think this helps at least a bit um, to, to mitigate kind of the negative effects of the novelty effect, which is actually a good thing as well. Um, but yes, um, I would still say that what I found in my research is quite the opposite. Um, I always had so far like quite a heterogeneous sample of participants, sometimes also people that work with VR on a daily basis. And um, when all of them found or find the benefits and they were, for example, prompted to reflect or, or they said something like, well, I wasn't even sure that I was thinking this and that person when I, when I imagined happiness. And I really want to go now to this person and uh, tell or write a WhatsApp message to this person and tell this person that actually, you know, you had this kind of small revelation on a small scale. I would say this is due to the experience that they had in VR. Regarding the second question, uh, if we can kind of extract um, entities or some, yeah, affordances of VR. Um, it's actually a very interesting question to think of. Um, I think what in my research, what was really the most amazing thing for people were that they were not in reality. Um, they were completely shut off. They were alone with their thoughts, with their emotions. They did not feel watched um, by other people. Although they know it was a study and their uh, results would be used in the study. So, I think this is actually a success, which led me to think that it is VR that we are looking at, at a very big part. Um, I would say besides being alone with yourself, um, which is which we could have in reality, for example, by hiking up a mountain and just be there by yourself in the sunrise or so. Um, I think these are just things that we do not um, allow ourselves to have so much in our daily lives. And I think this is, this is something that we could learn from these experiences to include this kind of me time and self-care in our daily lives, but because a lot of people do not find the time for that or they need support to get into this um, feeling of me time and self-care, um, I think for that we are can be really helpful possibility to, to guide these people. I hope this kind of answers your question. Good, awesome. Okay. Any other questions? Sure, see you. Sorry, yes. Uh, hi, thank you for the presentation. Really lovely. I'm just looking at, um, I don't know if you look of the experience of actually wearing a head mounted display and if this has affected any of the outcomes of the study. I mean, for instance, wearing a head mounted display for long periods of time can have you know negative effects on that person. I don't know if this is something you've managed to look at. Uh, yes, we did. In the mindfulness study um, with the artificial grass, for example, this was quite a long study. We had four conditions that we compared uh, to with each other, and I think it was like one and a half hours in total, which was not completely done in VR, but I think in general they spent like 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes in VR in like three different like phases. So I would say one session is about 17 to 20 minutes. 
and um, we had some people complaining about um, like bad posture that they got that felt strain in their neck from wearing the HMD. Um, and I think this is really something where the technical possibilities need to be enhanced. I'm look, really looking forward to the next generations of HMDs. I hope that they will be lighter, that they will be less constraining. Um, in all my studies, I tried to do it wireless or via air link or so, so that at least we don't have the cable uh, attached to the PC, which uh, yeah, kind of restricts our movement. Um, what I felt in my studies is that when you give them something to look around, you know, not something like it's a 2D space in front of you, but that they can actually move their head over their shoulders, this actually helps them to not feel the strain so much. So this is something that I can also share from my experience. Um, the mindfulness where they were not really looking around because they needed to focus on themselves, it was quite like it was mentioned quite a lot of times. Um, in the mood worlds, for example, not once. And I think it is because people were actually moving around so much. OK, well, that, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I, I see the durations are quite long, and I think it will. Um, obviously, there is a limitation of technology, and you can always have to map it. So thank you for now. Really great. Um, just my last question. Is that, uh, you mentioned that some of the studies, they some of the Participants are at home whilst wearing the head-mounted display. Is that correct? Um, have you noticed if any of the external factors of that person being at home has affected the outcome of the study? For instance, if my my mother or my girlfriend suddenly says hello and uh, they disturb the session, has that been accounted for in any way? Um, yeah, we try to mitigate these effects by our uh, specific study setup. Um, so people needed to make sure that the door was closed, that no one was at home, or if they were at home, they needed to uh, put um, a paper on the floor, on the um, on the door saying that they should not be disturbed within the next hour. They needed to have quite like they could not have um, a meeting or some other date after the study. Um, so that was all requirement that we set up exactly due to this point uh, that they were not disturbed. Um, there was not one participant who told us that they were disturbed, uh, but of course we cannot make sure because we rely on uh, what the participants told us. Um, so I think, especially in the remote setting, it has very like quite a, quite a lot of benefits, I would say. Um, especially people reported that they felt super comfortable, that they were like um, having their favorite smell of the tea beforehand. You know, they were kind of relaxed before they started the study, some of them. Um, others said that, um, yeah, it was, it was interesting that they knew when they would go out of the virtual environment, they would feel very comfy in their own home, right? So this did have like, I would say, a rather positive effect on the study. Um, of course, it also has the yeah, negative points that we as researchers um, yeah, just need to yeah, be able to, to deal with them, which is we cannot be sure what they actually tell us afterwards, you know, because we just rely on their personal, um, uh, personal stories that they tell us. And um, I, for my part, we did a lot of time being really sure that the study setup that we had, study design, is uh, kind of suitable for home experiences. This is also a recommendation that I can share. Um, I, I think I never spent so much time doing the study design than I did for Mood Worlds, um, and it was really worth it. You know, talk to uh, collaborators, talk to other authors, just talk to people saying like, "Oh yeah, when you're at home, when would you do a study? At which time, for example, would you do it?" Um, to to really think things through, but I think in my case I did not have so much problem. I would rather say it was um, very beneficial for my study to do it in a remote setting. Great, thank you so much. Really, really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much for the question. Any other questions online? Okay, I have a question. I know you've got some studies ongoing. But um, have you any, have you got any ideas for future research where to take this research? 
Yeah, I mean, I tackled some of the future research, uh, right? Um, I personally think that especially the how to design negative effect um, is a very big and broad topic um, because we know from ethical considerations that it's always hard to do studies where you actively immerse people in negative effect. Um, but I think this can be quite beneficial and I can also see that there are several other studies coming out of this, you know, that take this topic further. I would say um, in general, uh, it's, it's very interesting also to think more about the reflection topic. How can we um, kind of enhance things like move worlds, which is very explorative, very fun and very open, but we still need to have the scaffolding um, included. You know, I don't know if it is maybe higher questions that you ask, but how should this question be asked? When should they be asked? Of course, we also have the creative process that we do not want to disturb as flow of the VR. And I think these are like very interesting research topics for the future. So um, first of all, like how can we help people to reflect more, which is probably most of the time done by talking to people or via questions that you answer for yourself without really disturbing the um, flow. And on the other hand, how should you, you know, do this questioning and also how, how should we think of including other people there. So the whole thing of multi-user, do it with a friend, do it with a stranger. There will be a lot of differences there also from the creativity that can be expressed in this, in this stuff. So I think these are all like very interesting fields for future research. And it's uh, always hard to decide where you want to take your research because you just have limited time for that. Um, but I hope that there will be more time and I think at that point I can also say that I'm I'm really open for new ideas in this regard. So if one of you says like, well, Nadine, let's do something together in this and this matter, I'm really open for that as well because I just love thinking about the topic from different perspectives. And um, maybe if some of you have some some great ideas, uh, please message me somehow uh, and get into contact with me, and we can definitely get to the meeting to talk this through. Okay, that sounds great. Um, especially, thank you for answering my question. Because um, one of the things I was going to say about researching the negative emotions is the ethical uh, component. But there is still research uh, conducted on, um, you know, negative emotions. Um, it's it's the intensity of those emotions that should be controlled. So perhaps, you know, there are, I have a few papers that I've saved actually on uh, on this topic, which is quite interesting that you mentioned that. So maybe we could actually talk about something later on because yeah. there is way there are ways of going around ethics with that, uh, with like memory recall and things like that. So yeah, okay, wonderful. No more other anyone have any other questions? No. No. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Let me just stop.